We are now back on uh, talking about intervals. We're talking about intervals where the data came from a normal distribution. So there's a normal pop population distribution. And uh, that assumption is going to be made very explicitly in this chapter. It was suggested in previous sections, like this probably works better if your data is normal, but it might work if it's not, if your sample size is large. And in the case of the T confidence interval, you could probably get away with using the T confidence interval if your data is not normally distributed, if your sample sizes are sufficiently large. If your sample size is a thousand, it doesn't really matter. Um, and that's fine. But for the, the uh, other intervals that I'm going to be talking about here, the normal distribution is actually quite important. And you cannot. Um, use the procedures here if you don't have normally distributed data. Okay, so let's uh, get started. We're gonna start with the following result. Suppose X bar is the sample mean of N IID normal random variables with mean mu and S is the sample standard deviation. The random variable T, which is X bar minus mu divided by S over the square root of N, follows a T distribution with mu, which which equals N, oh, oh darn it. Uh, New equals n minus one degrees of freedom, uh, which we often denote with t following a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So here, oh, this is so it's so unfortunate that that got cut off like that. So uh, here are some properties of the t distribution. First. Uh, the T distribution is symmetric around zero and bell shaped. So symmetric around zero and bell shaped. Uh, that's the first property. The second property is that T curves generally have heavier tails uh, than these tails than the standard normal distribution, which is what you should compare them against. Uh, three, uh, as new as the degrees of freedom parameter new, that's the Greek letter new, as that grows large, the T distribution with new degrees of freedom starts to resemble the normal distribution. And this is ultimately why you're able to get away with saying that your data uh, well, basically by saying we can use a T-confidence interval even if our data isn't normally distributed because often uh, the actual distribution will start to obey what the central limits theorem says it's going to do. So here's actually some of a sketch of uh, what T of these uh, properties to summarize. Here is a zero. I'm going to draw what I'm going to represent as a uh, standard normal curve, uh, something like this. Uh, it's a it's a sketch. So this black line will be a standard normal curve. And uh, here's how the T curves are behaving. Let's say that we have a curve where where it's a T distribution with five degrees of freedom. We're talking about as PDF. And I'm not going to write down it's PDF because the PDF for the T distribution is quite difficult. So uh, its curve looks something like this, where um, the key points of this uh, little graphic is that um, the tails of the T distribution with five degrees of freedom are much heavier than the than the normal distribution's uh, tails. Uh, and also, as a result of that, that means that the the random variable represented by this PDF is tends to be further away from its mean. This does have a mean, and it's a more spread out distribution. So, since less area is concentrated in the in a, in the in that that central region, that means that the mode is going to be lower. For this curve and uh, the tails are going to be heavier. Uh, if we were to look at say 
a T distribution with 20 degrees of freedom, then it will have heavier tails than the normal distribution, but lighter tails than the T distribution with five degrees of freedom, which means also that it will be uh, having a higher peak. So the blue line is supposed to be emblematic of a T distribution with 20 degrees of freedom. So it's starting to look a lot like a T distribution, uh, well, like a standard normal distribution. And in fact, if we were to go to 100, the two curves would be extremely similar. Uh, the, the standard normal curve and the T distribution with 100 degrees of freedom. They're not the same, but they're pretty close. And in fact, as you increase your degrees of freedom, eventually the two curves would become the same thing if you could plug in infinity degrees of freedom. So... Uh, the T distribution depends on a parameter knows the degrees of freedom. Um, we've talked about degrees of freedom before. It's related to the fact that when you sum up, uh, when you have computed the sample mean and you sum up uh, the residuals of your data, which is going to be xi minus x bar. This this is a typo. There's a lot of a lot of typos in this. This should be i. Um, when you add those up, they're going to add up to zero. So that means that n minus one deviations from the mean are all, only n minus one of them are freely determined, not all n, once you know what the sample mean is. So the t critical values, which I'm denoting by t alpha nu, this is mostly a definitional uh, point that I'm making right here. Uh, this, this notation means that if we have a t uh, random variable following a t distribution with new degrees of freedom, then the probability that t nu uh, is greater than t uh, alpha nu, uh, that's going to equal alpha. So I'm just using that for notational purposes. Uh, if you want, if you want, you can think of there being a bell-shaped curve. This curve corresponds to the t distribution with new degrees of freedom, uh, and t alpha and t alpha nu. Uh, is going to be the value such that the area underneath the curve to the right of this value is equal to alpha. Uh, so table 8.5 of DeVore's book contains uh, critical values for the T distribution uh, for various alpha and nu. Uh, for now, I'm happy with just using R to look up these critical values. Um, since I basically established it in these videos, I'm not going to be looking up things in tables. All right. So uh, suppose you want to compute a confidence interval for uh, the population mean mu. Remember, we are assuming that the data came from a normal distribution. Uh, our confidence interval then will be uh, x bar plus or minus t alpha over 2 uh and its degrees of free number n minus one uh, divide uh, multiplied with the st uh, the standard error s over the square root of n. Okay, and that translates into an interval. So this basically means x bar minus t alpha over two n minus one s over square root of n and x bar plus t alpha over two n minus 1, s over root n. And if you wanted upper bounds or lower bounds rather than an interval, you're going to replace plus or minus with either plus or minus, depending on whether you want an upper or lower bound respectively, and replace t alpha over 2, n minus 1, with t alpha, n minus 1. So in other words, don't divide alpha by 2. Uh, so... Um, if we're going to be using T confidence intervals like this, it seems like we should probably uh, check whether the data did in fact come from a normal distribution. And we've talked about ways we could do this. We could use box plots. We could use statistical tests. We could use QQ plots. Uh, use whatever method you prefer. In these lecture notes, we're going to use QQ plots to decide whether normality is, appropriate, is an appropriate assumption for the data set. So, uh, example six, this is using the same kind of a, uh, narrative uh, that's been running in the uh, previous two sections where we have this factory producing ball bearings. 
Assume that the diameter of ball bearings from example three follow a normal distribution. Uh, compute the requested CI, but using the T distribution compared to the CI found in example three. From that example, uh, they said the uh, sample size was 60. Um, or was it 61? I think it was 61. So the sample size was 61. Uh, so the degrees of freedom is going to be n minus 1, which is equal to 60. All right. Uh, alpha, in this case, we want a 95% confidence interval. So this will be 0.05. So what that means is that the critical value uh, n minus 1 uh, is going to be uh, t sub point, uh, 0.025. Uh, uh, 60 and use whatever you like. You can use R if you wish to get what this competent, uh, what this uh, um, critical value is going to be. But this actually turns out to be 2.000. And uh, so that's uh, kind of funny because I often said that uh, because that seems like the critical value you'd use if you were roughly using the normal distribution. It's purely coincidence in this case. But that's going to be the appropriate critical value. Uh, the sample mean, recall that that was 10.488, and the sample standard deviation was 0 0.105. Okay, then the confidence interval is going to be 10.488 uh, plus or minus uh, 2 times 0 0.105 over the square root of 61, uh, which is going to be uh, 10.488 plus or minus 0 0.027. So the margin of error in this case is larger uh, than when we were assume, when we were basically using the normal distribution uh, for computing our critical values. So this is always going to be the case because the uh, t critical values are always larger than the corresponding normal distribution critical values. So you'll always end up with larger confidence intervals. And what this is telling us is that by using the central limit theorem, when we say we're computing 95% confidence intervals, if our data actually came from a normal distribution, we are uh, computing intervals when we're using that normal distribution instead of the T distribution that are too narrow and thus are not conservative. Uh, conservative meaning that we like to err on the side of too large as opposed to too small confidence intervals uh, or too wide as opposed to too narrow. So... I mean, this, th that said, the difference is often quite minor, not enough to uh, be too concerned. All right, so uh, here's some R code. The function response, uh, well, actually, there's a class of functions responsible for working with the T distribution. Those are going to be the QT. Well, that's going to be DT, PT, QT, and RT. And um, QT is what you're using to get your uh, critical values. Uh, it has a degrees of freedom parameter, which we are setting to n minus 1. So that's how you're going to get the critical values if you're going to be using R. Notice that I plugged in 0 0.975 because the upper tail area at that critical value will then be 0 0.025. Okay. Uh, there are other statistical intervals that statisticians like to compute besides confidence intervals. The first such interval we're going to talk about is a prediction interval. Prediction, uh, a prediction interval is an interval intended to describe the range of values that will likely include a future observation. So if we denote our future observation with xn plus 1, because we have a sample of size n, then uh, the interval uh, is, then the interval lx1 to xn, ux1 to xn, is a is a 100 times 1 minus alpha percent pr prediction interval if the uh, excuse me, all right. If the probability that L of x one notice that I've replaced with random values uh, that L of x one to x n is less than or equal to x n plus one 
Uh, notice that that's different from what we were running before, where we had theta in the middle. Uh, and then we have u uh, x1 to xn. Uh, this probability needs to equal 1 minus alpha. So, uh, for normally distributed data, the prediction interval is going to be x bar plus or minus uh, t alpha over 2 n minus 1 uh, times s times the square root of 1 over n plus 1. So notice something about this interval. This interval is always going to be wider than the confidence interval. Furthermore, with a confidence interval, you basically don't have this part, right? You, you remove that part and then you have a confidence interval. That's basically the difference between the two. Um, if we look at this, if we were, okay, let's say we were working with the confidence interval. This part right here is going to zero. Which means that if you were working with a confidence interval, in general for confidence intervals, what you should expect is that you, as you increase the sample size, the width of the interval tends to go to zero. Until eventually it would collapse onto the point estimate, because your point estimate would be equal to the truth. That's what you should expect for confidence intervals, which means that as you increase your sample size, these things will continue to get smaller and smaller. But in this case... This interval does not have that property. Rather, when we increase our sample size, this interval is going to have a margin of error that is, um, uh, well, basically this, this, this multiplicative factor is going to go to 1. Uh, this part right here is going to approach z alpha over 2. And s you can think of as approaching sigma. And x bar, as you increase your sample size, should be approaching mu. So what you end up with is, let's say that alpha was a point oh was point nine five. Um, this is going to course. This is eventually going to become the prediction interval for a random variable. That's just like uh, what's the problem? Uh, how, how how should I describe this? Um, it's ultimately just going to be a prediction interval for the random variable as if you knew all the parameter values. Right. So uh, we've seen such intervals before. Like, for example, uh, I think it, I think I had an example in chapter four, section five, where I was asking for a prediction interval for the price of a stock. Uh, basically, this is going to the interval is going to collapse down into a constant. Um, uh, it's going to approach as the sample size approaches infinity, all going well, mu plus or minus Z alpha over two sigma over root. N uh, no, no, not no sigma over root N, uh, just sigma, which you should recognize as being the interval enclosed by, uh, the appropriate quantiles of the normal distribution. So, like, for example, if you want a 95% prediction interval, this interval is going to approach the uh, interval enclosed by a normal distribution with mean mu, okay, by the quant the 2.5th and 97.5th percentiles of a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. So, these intervals do not have the property of going to zero. Instead, they're going to go to an interval uh, in the end. And um, um, uh, yeah, they're always going to be wider than the uh, corresponding uh, confidence interval, which should make sense because these prediction intervals need to account for the variability in the data itself, not just variation in the uh, estimate of the data, which is related to the variation in the data itself, but ultimately will go to zero. No, these intervals are going to uh, always have to account for the natural variation in the data itself, plus any variation that comes from having to estimate the parameters of the distribution. 
All right, and if you wanted to, you could instead have a uh, prediction upper or lower bounds, and it's just going to involve the usual, usual substitutions, replace plus or minus with either plus or minus, replace alpha for two with alpha. All right, uh, over the past 121 days, the daily percentage change of the price of the stock with ticker symbol CGM at the following simple mean and standard deviation. A look at these daily returns uh, probability plot suggests that we can reasonably assume that the price flu fluctuations follow a normal distribution. If you're thinking that you're about to go out there and make a bunch of money by investing in some stocks, uh, uh, hold on there, Jethro. <laughs> you should probably hold off for a second. Um, all right. So, <laughs> as I saw in a Twitter video, slow down there, buckaroo. Basically, the problem is that uh, stock prices are not normally distributed. Or at least when we look empirically at stock prices, a normal distribution, just a naive normal distribution where you have IID uh, innovations in the returns of a stock, uh, that doesn't describe how stock prices behave very well. All right, uh, construct a 99% prediction lower bound for price movements. All right, so here's how we're going to do this. Uh, our degrees of freedom parameter is going to be new, which is equal to 121, because there's 120 because the sample size is 121. So new is 121 minus one, which is 120. Uh, alpha is equal to 0 0.01, uh, which means that our critical value will be t. Alpha over, no, no, not alpha over two, because this is a lower bound. Because in principle, it's okay if your stock is too small. No, it's okay if your stock is too large and you're surprised by making more money than you thought, but you don't want your stock to surprise you by being much smaller than what you thought. So we'll have T alpha nu. Uh, this is equal to T.01, uh, 120. Uh, which is equal to 2.358. Okay, then. So, um, right, we got that. So that means that uh, X bar uh, minus T alpha and minus 1 times uh, S square root uh, 1 over N plus 1 is equal to uh, uh, negative 0 0.005. Really? Really? Oh, yeah. Yep. That's the mean return. I don't know why you're investing in a stock that tends to go down. Uh, but it does. So, uh, so negative 0 0.005. I should probably mention this is not a percent. But this is not a percentage okay so that's not how we should think about this uh, minus 2.358 uh, hold on I'm actually running out of room so so let's uh, so this is equal to uh, negative 0 0.00 5 minus 2.358 times 0 0.092 times the square root of 1 over uh, 121 plus 1. And that is going to be approximately a negative 0 0.22. So you think that there's a 99% chance that you'll get a return from this stock above negative 22%, which is uh, not not great. <laughs> this is not this is not great. So I I don't know what your plan for making money from this stock is, but well, kind of is what it is. So uh, here's some Arco that's doing the same thing. Uh, and it's wrong. Uh, okay. All right. I don't think this number is right. I do not think that is right. And I don't think this is right. 
Do you see the error? The error is right here. It looks to me like uh, I should put a parentheses right there and not there. So, uh, you know what? Let's go fix this. Let's go do this right. Uh, okay. So, all right. So, let's uh, do this the right way. Uh, we're probably gonna actually just have to put this on a different screen. So, all right, uh, we have a negative 0 0.005. Oh, I've got the notes right here. All right, so negative 0 0.005 uh, minus 2.358 times uh, 0 0.092 times the square root 1 divided by uh, 121 plus 1 uh, and then oh that's it yeah we're done so oh okay I guess it's the same thing I don't know something something doesn't seem right it's like something about that code does not seem right. Uh, those aren't the same number, though. Yeah, those two numbers are not the same. So I think the fact that they're really close is mostly just coincidence. Yeah, because if we were to maybe look... If we were to... Let's start taking some stuff apart so that's going to be 0 0.021 what is this hmm i don't know i don't know why i mean they're they're not the same number very clearly uh i think we might have just lucked out or something uh in that this number is wrong but for some reason it's close to the right answer which i guess can happen sometimes okay um Got to watch out for that though. <laughs> you don't want you don't want close to the right answer though. You want the right answer. Uh, confident and, and also it might work once and then later on betray you. All right. Uh, confidence intervals are meant to capture the mean and prediction and in, so confidence intervals capture the mean. Prediction in, intervals capture future values. Tolerance intervals are intervals such that at least k percent of the population should be between the bounds of the interval. Uh, this statement is made with confidence level 100 times 1 minus alpha percent. These intervals are kind of weird. Um, uh, we can have, for instance, an interval such that with 95% confidence, nine, at least 99% of the population is within the bounds of the interval. That's how you would discuss such intervals. They're, they're a stranger one, uh, admittedly. Here's kind of a visualization of what's being done with a tolerance interval so what we're trying to do is come up with an interval and uh this so this interval should contain some proportion of the population so it captures k percent of the population hopefully at least k percent so this is at least uh, k percent of the population uh, with confidence of uh, 100 uh, 1 minus alpha percent so we have a confidence level that describes the uncertainty associated with the procedure and describes um, the probability that this procedure actually does what we want it to do. What do we want it to do? We want it to capture, uh, we want the interval to contain at least a certain percentage of the population. That's what a tolerance interval is. So they're really weird. Um, it, for starters, 
going back to kind of that analysis I was having when talking about a prediction interval. Um, when I was talking about a prediction interval, I was saying that these intervals actually, if you were to increase your sample size, they're not going to collapse down to a point. Which, if you study confidence intervals, that's what they do. Tolerance intervals are going to do the same thing. They are not going to collapse down to a point. Instead, what they're going to try to do, instead they're going to collapse down to an interval. In fact, it'll be the same interval that the prediction intervals uh, collapse down to. So that means that the two intervals are very similar, right? No, that doesn't mean that. Um, well, they kind of are. But here's the thing. Um, a prediction interval tries to predict where one future observation will be. A tolerance interval will try to will be an interval such that k percent of current value uh, k percent of the current population values k percent of current random variables are past in our future but at least k percent of that of all random variables seen over time will be in the interval so not just one instance of a future observation but all instances of that observation so infinity instances if you want if you prefer um yeah and also it doesn't help that they've actually got two percentages uh going on you have the confidence level and also the percentage of the population that these things are capturing which is what they're trying to do you're not just trying uh, like a prediction interval would be like okay we're trying to predict someone's weight uh, we have this data set. Where do we think a single person's weight is going to be? A prediction interval would be an interval such that you say that 95% of all, or 99% of all people have weights between X and Y with 95% confidence. So we are so we are some somewhat confident that. A certain percentage of the population is in this interval. And furthermore, they're going to, if they're if they're working well, they're going to contain more than that po percentage. Like they say they contain at least K percent of the population and they won't contain uh, K percent. They'll contain more than that if things went well because a tolerance interval has to account for variation in the uh, estimated parameter values. So they have to be wider than if you knew what those parameter values were, in which case there would be mu plus or minus uh, z, uh, uh, z star sigma, where z star is the appropriate critical value. Um, they're going to be they're going to be wider than that because there's variation in x bar and there's a variation in your standard deviation, which causes them to be wider and thus contain more than k percent of the population. So there's something else to to consider too. Um, so tolerance intervals take the form, uh, X bar, your sample mean, because that's your best guess as to what the population mean is plus or minus the tolerance critical value. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I'm going to write about that. So the tolerance critical value, um, so they basically get their own critical values that are not coming from the T distribution times the sample standard deviation. Uh, so uh, all right, so we still have the natural translation to tolerance bounds. Uh, tolerance cr critical values are given in table 8.6 of the textbook. This is one where um, I actually don't know what distribution these numbers are being pulled from. Uh, but uh, this is actually one where I actually do want to look at that table 8.6, which unfortunately is sideways. Uh, so that's kind of a pain, but... You can so uh, maybe turn your phone, cell phone sideways for a second or something, uh, but you have a confidence level, which is referring to how likely this procedure is to actually do what you want it to do, and then also the percentage of the population you want the interval to capture. So you would look up. Well, first off, you decide whether your interval is one-sided or two-sided, and then you decide on your confidence level, either ninety-five percent or ninety-nine percent, and then you decide what proportion of the population you want to capture. Then you give it your sample size and uh, the, and then you just look up the critical value from the table. Um, or you can use the tolerance package in R. <laughs> uh, but in order to use the tolerance package in R, you actually have to have the entire data set.
I bet though that there is some function in R that looks up tolerance critical values. I just don't know what it is. Um, okay. So, uh, example eight. In light of previous studies, management has instructed the assembly line producing 10 millimeter ball, ball bearings to retool. After the retooling process, a sample of 50 ball bearings is produced by the line. Management will be satisfied if 99% of all ball bearings produced by the line have a diameter that is within 0.1 millimeters of the specified diameter of 10 millimeters. Construct a 99% tolerance interval for the diameter of ball bearings that is correct with 95% confidence using the following data set. Uh, I, compute, I check that this uh, data set is normal, and it is. Uh, the, so you've got the mean and the standard deviation of the ball bearings. So now uh, we just kind of need to fill in the rest. So the uh, tolerance critical value. Uh, so the tolerance critical value. Uh, according to my table was um, 3.385. So that means that our interval will be 9.996 plus or minus uh, 3.385 times 0 0.029, uh, the corresponding statistics, which translates to the interval uh, 9.996 plus or minus 0 0.098, uh, which is going to be uh, 9.898 and uh, 10.094. So then the question is, if you're management, what do you think about this? And you want it to be within zero point. What was the specification that that I said? How how much do we want it to be within? Um, zero point one millimeter. Uh, and here we have just a bare miss. I it's it's just a little bit smaller. Zero point zero nine eight. So ideally, this interval would be. Uh, 9.9 .9 and 10.1 and I mean it rounds to that it's not exactly that I I guess then it would depend on how picky management is they might look at this interval and say all right then this machine is working the way we want it to so and I probably would uh, but I'm also not management so all right if you're curious you can construct these intervals um, via the tolerance package in R. What you do is you load in this package uh, and uh, you use the function norm tall int uh, bearings. Here's the data set. Here is the alpha by which we that corresponds to the confidence level. Here is the P corresponding to the population proportion we wish to capture and side equals two for a two sided interval. So it gives us uh, the uh, lower bound and uh, oh they came up with something a little bit different and so here's our lower bound and here's our upper bound okay uh, so what do you do when you don't have normally distributed data and is not large then I guess it depends on what it is you're trying to do some procedures such as the T procedures are actually fairly robust to the normality assumption you, they, you can even use them in smaller sample sizes when your data is not normally distributed or you don't know that it is but it's reasonably symmetric if that's the case the t procedures still seem to work pretty well uh the prediction intervals and the tolerance intervals should not be reduced and should not be used in non-normal situations the normality assumption for those intervals is actually very critical which you can kind of tell by that anal by my little asymptotic analysis saying these intervals start to resemble the uh, corresponding interval for a normal distribution. Uh, other things that you might try uh, are uh, non-parametric methods. You might try bootstrapping, um, stuff like that. And we're not going to discuss the other non-parametric books uh, about this. And there's actually a book uh, by Hannah Meeker uh, 
uh, this book is um, so uh, hmm, I guess I don't oh yeah it's a book called Statistical Intervals it's all about statistical intervals so if you want to learn more about statistical intervals then you can read this book all right so that concludes this section uh, next section is on uh, confidence intervals for the population variance and standard deviation for normally for a normally a normal population so I will see you there